Hello world on the web, I'm Dr. Shadow, the Air Personality with us here. And here's a movie for which I could not stop seeing advertisements for some reason. The Meg, directed by John Turtletob, was based on the novel Meg, a novel of deep terror by Steve Alton from 1997. Interestingly enough, the rights for a film adaptation were acquired by Hollywood Pictures way back in 90 fucking 6. Not entirely sure how they pulled that one off. The movie rights bounce back and forth for a while, but it's a shark movie. Like most, there's water, attractive scientists, and a body count. However, the hook this time is that the shark in question is a motherfucking megalodon. Which should tell you right there whether or not you're going to enjoy this movie. You've got Jason Statham doing battle with an enormous fish, the likes of which by all accounts should not exist in reality. If that does not sound like a good time to you, then outlining the plot any further probably isn't going to change your mind. To put it simply, Jason Statham is Jonas, an ironically named Deep Sea Rescue Man, who is brought in to perform a rescue at the deepest parts of the ocean, even deeper than previously thought possible. However, during the course of events, a prehistoric sea monster is released to the unsuspecting sea above, a megalodon. And now this ragtag team of attractive scientists must destroy it before it kills... well, uh, more than it has. Let's try and keep the casualties in the double digits. Once it hits 100, it starts looking like we weren't even fucking trying. So let's take a look at The Meg and see just what you can do with Jason Statham, a novel, and about $150 million to throw at the effects team. Our story begins at a deep-sea rescue mission of a nuclear submarine in the Philippine Trench. It's 10,000 meters down, and even the goddamn K-278 Komsomolets has a crush depth of only 1.5 thousand meters, but if you're gonna watch this movie, you gotta let little things like the laws of physics slide. Jason Statham is Jonas, part of a three-man deep-sea rescue team. However, this simple impossible mission runs into trouble as something keeps slamming into the sub! There's something out there. Oh, don't worry, that's just Disney at it again, trying to consume everything around it. They let the Meg slip through their fingers once, never again. The massive creature turns out to be the one thing complicating this rescue mission, and as such, Jonas has to make the tough call. Wait here and try to save his two friends' lives, or... Oh, okay, fuck it, I guess sacrifice them to save everyone else is the way to go. What have you done? saved your life, blew up a sea monster, and ensured that the rest of the movie was going to happen. The, well, I guess without Jonas, the rest of the movie could still happen, but they'd lose. After this, we skip ahead five years to the year... Um, uh, well, I'm not sure, but it sure looks impressive. And to the Mana One Research Station, positioned 200 miles off the coast of China, despite the Mariana Trench actually being about 3,000 miles away, but details, details. The important thing is that Mana One's financial benefactor has arrived, Jack Morris, played by Rain Wilson. He meets up with Dr. Minwei Zhang, played by Winston Chow, as well as his daughter and granddaughter, Su Yin, played by Bingbing Li, and Mei Ying, played by Shuya Sophia Kai. Now, to see where all his billions in research dollars has went. Did you have those whales here on cue? I might have lured them with some whale songs. Really? Disco dolphin or baleen out of hell? Introducing the CGI whales Lucy and Gracie isn't what we're watching for, though. We want to know who else is acting in this. As such, we are introduced to the rest of the team. Jax, played by Ruby Rose, Dr. Heller, one of the opening survivors, played by Robert Taylor, DJ, played by Paige Kennedy, and the station chief, Mac, played by Cliff Curtis. Also, down below, we have Lori Taylor, played by Jessica McNamee, and the two others in the submarine, Toshi, played by my favorite hero from Heroes Hero, Masi Oka, and finally, The Wall. That's what they call him. Played by Olafar Dari Olafsson. Blah, that's a mouthful. Where the hell country is this guy from? Connecticut. Anyway, their mission is to the bottom of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. Or is it? I've heard a theory that what we think is the bottom might actually be a layer of hydrogen sulfide. So we're running an experiment to get down there and ask one of the crew to just get out, take a deep breath, and report back what it smells like. Actually, the plan is to dive down and hope it's a cloud. And what if you're wrong? Then you have wasted 1.3 billion dollars. <laughs> you're kidding. <laughs> so much for a plan B. No bother, plan A is ready to go. We are go for insertion. Insertion. <laughs> it's everything sexual with you guys. Sex, food, power, and money. <laughs> I like these guys. Oh fuck, they're gonna die, aren't they? 
There's also the question of how exactly they can withstand unknown pressures and just how the fuck they're maintaining communication with the surface wirelessly underwater, let alone that far underwater, but hell, they got this ridiculously high-end sci-fi submarine gear, so I guess it's not too far of a stretch. They look out and, indeed, it is a cloud, allowing their team to be the first people ever to really reach the true, real, deepest depths of the ocean floor. A new world, never before seen by human eyes. With that and the handy-dandy underwater Wi-Fi they got going, they launch a rover to get some up-close and personal looks at the flora and fauna down there. Rover one signal interrupted. Whoa, I just lost telemetry. The hell? Oh, don't get all jumpy. It's the bottom of the ocean. Really lonely down there. Fish that haven't seen anyone else in God knows how long. They probably just saw the thing and was like, FRIEND! Assuming it's a landslide, the sub swerves to avoid it, at which point it turns to follow them, slamming into the team. The continued assault on the submersible is enough for the team to figure out what the hell is going on. Oh my god, DJ Matt, there's someone down here! Jonas was right! Jonas was right, you caught- Though I'm not sure if I should be terrified, or thankful that the sea monster finally fixed that underwater Wi-Fi discrepancy. And yeah, that does still bother me. Now the team has a new problem. Yeah, the discovery still would rock the scientific world and all that jazz, but there are three people stranded down there now, and the options for rescue are very limited. We have to try something. They're six miles down, and no one has ever attempted a rescue at that depth. Well, that's not exactly true. No. No way. Not every problem can be fixed by Jason Statham, you madman! He's just gonna come in here, drive too fast, hook up with the hottest scientist around, and growl at everyone in British! But he also was the only man trained in deep-sea rescue to have ever survived a mission at 10,000 meters! Dr. Heller quickly points out that's because the guy left the rest of his team to die, but Dr. Zhang reminds everyone that Lori herself said in the last transmission that Jonas was right! Thus, with 18 hours till the crew dies, they very quickly make their way to Thailand, where Jonas has been hanging out for these past few years. In the novel, the man became a paleobiologist, conveniently filling his brain with knowledge of prehistoric sea life. Here, he's uh, filling his brain with alcohol, doing his best to wipe out whatever knowledge of anything he has left. Do you drink too much? And now you're only saying that because I literally have a beer in my hand. You always have beer in your hand. You know why? Ah, you can tell me to stop drinking around the same time I finally had enough alcohol in my system to completely wipe away any and all memories of Shane Black's The Predator. His normal daily routine of wake up, drink, pee, drink, sleep, repeat is interrupted, though, when Mac and Dr. Zhang show up, asking for his help. Which, before even hearing what specific help they want, he flatly rejects. I'll say no. You're gonna offer me money. I'll still say no. You're gonna appeal to my better nature. And I'm gonna say no, because I don't have one. Not entirely sure if Jason Statham is breaking character here or not. However, once Mac tells him that Lori is trapped down there, and coincidentally enough, she happens to be his ex-wife, now at the mercy of quite possibly the same species that attacked him in the opening, he's listening. Lori, in the meantime, is working with her crew to try and keep the life support systems operational. Unfortunately for her, powering everything up might not have been the best course of action. We gotta can the lights. It's a strange thing about bioluminescent sea creatures. Predators end up zeroing in on sources of light looking for food. Whoopsie! Worse, this attack not only left Lori punctured, but their oxygen tanks as well. Thus, Suyin decides fuck waiting for Jason Statham to show up. She's gonna hop in one of these tiny little subs that are of questionable value for a rescue mission and rescue the team her damn self! While she heads to the depths, Jonas shows up and just now learns of the doctor on the station who is to make sure he's in good enough shape for the mission, just so happens to be the same man he rescued years ago, who claimed Jonas's talks about some sea monster to be the result of pressure-induced psychosis. He's in perfect shape. Just like the last time you examined me. Hell, oh, fuck, if five years of alcoholism is that mundane... You know, hold on, I'm getting a beer. Heller wants to keep him for more tests, but considering the time constraints, Jonas decides to get right to the submarine and dive down to rescue his ex-wife. This doesn't go quite as smoothly as it could, though, as Suyin's kid Mei-Ying just so happens to be there in the sub, too, and takes the opportunity to exposit her mother's relationship status, just in case. Dad's with a Pilates instructor in Taipei. Granddad says Mom needs to move on, but Mom says she needs more time because she was married to an a-hole. 
Not a great guy like Jonas here, drowning his sorrows in alcohol. Mm. A ah, real step up for her he'd be. Much as child characters like to tag around in action movies, and indeed Mei Yang evidently didn't even exist in the novel, Jonas manages to get her off the sub, and promises to bring her mother back safely. I mean, her mother's not one of the people trapped down there, but that's still the only one Mei Ying really's worried about. So, on the way down, Jonas tries to convince Mac to talk her out of continuing her personal rescue mission. Tell her to get out of the way, Mac. Or people meet some more risk, and she's in way over her head. Jonas, you just told her yourself. What? Gotta pay attention to who's in the group chat, man. So, despite Jonas descending ridiculously fast, Suyin still managed to get into the sunken sub way ahead of him. Almost so easy, they never even needed to call the one-man A-team to begin with. Fiery magnetic hook. Three, two... <laughs> but, of course, there's still that whole... sea monster thing. I mean, either that or Jason Statham's star power manifested physically and just won't let anyone else take the glory. The creature that attacked her sub? A giant squid! Well, I've seen that of hand, I don't know where this is going. Fortunately, though, it's quickly killed and eaten by a ridiculously massive shark that also happened to be down there. It's Megalodon. Impossible. So glad I'm not crazy. I wouldn't go that far, Jonas. I mean, this one was at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, trapped for millions of years underneath a cloud of hydrogen sulfide that it just couldn't get past, and... We've still yet to explain where the one from the opening came from. With the threat of the giant fucking shark, and the fact that Suyin really can't do anything to help the track crew anyway, she's instructed to begin a very quick ascent back to the surface. It's fine, Jason Statham is here to save the day. Masterfully docking his sub to the other, he deftly takes care of the damaged hatch and offers a ray of hope to the survivors. Uh, tell me this isn't the world's best I told you so. Or he just came down here to tell Lori off one last time, close the hatch in her face, and leave them the fuck down there to die. I don't know. Taking the time to share awkward glances and make snazzy remarks might not have been the best course of action, though, as time is short and the Megalodon is closing fast. Okay, now you really can't hold this one against Jonas this time. I mean, unless you want to argue that the man's got psychic powers and forces other people to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Thus, Toshi fires up the sub's lights to ensure the Megalodon goes for him instead of the escaping crew in a final act of heroism. And upon reaching the surface with everyone else safe and accounted for, Jonas is immediately chastised by Suyin for failing to save each and every last one of them! You left him, because that's who you are. You are the guy who leaves people behind. Oh, now, now... He also grimaces a lot and has a bit of a drinking problem. He basically tells her, Hey, deep sea shit is hard, and sometimes you die, and you fuckers knew that well before you sent him down there. That taken care of, Jonas goes to find out exactly how his ex-wife is doing. The puncher just missed her liver. She lost a lot of blood. But she's stable. Well, I would hope it missed her liver. I mean, that happens to be on the other side of her body there. Heller does have something else he'd like to tell Jonas, though. Sorry. I was wrong. Which is also different from the book, believe it or not. In that, he's like, oh, you said a Megalodon attacked, but you were just crazy. Now, a Megalodon attacked? Well, maybe, but the first time you were still crazy and I still hate you for it. While everyone's lining up to apologize to Jonas, Suyin shows up at his door to express her sorrow. I just want to apologize for before. I was angry and I lose my temper and you did save my... You're naked. So I am. Care to join me? After this less than subtle hint that, hey, Jonas and Suyin might just so happen to have romantic interests toward each other, the question comes up as to what exactly the very, very expensive research station is going to do now. I mean, sure, they've proved the Mariana Trench was not the true deepest part of the ocean, or they proved it was, but it in fact was slightly deeper than previously thought, but Morris thinks they need to keep going down there, giant fucking sharks be damned, because otherwise some other ridiculously expensive oceanic research station with a fleet of submarines capable of withstanding pressures far higher than anything any submersible has ever been reasonably expected to survive will just swoop in and take all the discoveries for themselves. A very odd thing to be worried about. It doesn't matter anyway, the team has a far, far more tangible threat to concern themselves with. Hello? Oh. Oh. 
going to be the other alternative. What's that? Ah, uh, it's just the plot coming to bite you in the ass. Far more literally this time around. That Nam not being enough to do much beyond surface damage to the station, it still causes enough of a disturbance that Mac, Jonas, and Suyin rush down there to find out what's wrong. Sure, the damage looks severe and like big fucking teeth marks, but after our little calf friend shows up, they figure that monster the kid's talking about was just a whale. Except for one other oddity. Where's the mom? Strange. Well, don't worry, Sue, you don't have to be scared of that mean, mean whale anymore. The fact that they have a megalodon way higher up does leave them confused, but looking at the data, they quickly realize that while the cloud down there is near freezing temperatures, their little rescue and escape pushed a lot of the stuff out of the way, allowing the warmer water underneath to form a path more than large enough for a megalodon to swim through. The problems related to a deep sea creature surviving the far, far lower pressure environment of the higher waters isn't answered, though, just ignored. No time to bother worrying too much about that anyway, because several boats have been sunk nearby. Just so happen to be equipped with handy-dandy emergency locator beacons, even though it's not like they would have wanted to be caught doing what they were doing out there. They cut off the fins and throw the shark back to die. All for a bowl of soup. Looks like the Meg even the score. Yes, shark poaching is bad. I know! I don't need to be reminded about it every single time I watch a shark movie. I mean, it's not like every slasher movie I see takes five minutes out of its time to remind the audience of the tragic rise of knife crime. But the Meg is still nearby. However, it won't be for long, and they must figure out what to do. Why don't you just put a tracker on it? Don't you guys ever watch Shark Week? Well, that's awfully convenient, just heading out to check on these boats, and hey, we've got the stuff we need to catch a Megalodon. I mean, I'm sure they prepared ahead of time before heading out, but it also kind of just established that none of them even realized they had trackers there. So that's the plan. Whack it and track it, with Jason Satham suiting up to go down in the water and shoot the bastard. Easier said than done, as the gun only shoots about 100 feet. 100 feet? Get really close before you shoot. Great. I was wondering, when you're close enough that you are under a very real risk of being knocked out by an errant sea monster fart, can you really consider that a long-range weapon? Fun fact, Jason Statham is actually a pretty kick-ass swimmer, so quite a lot of the shots of Jonas swimming around is in fact the actor himself actually putting in the work. Shane Bell was still his stunt double for the more dangerous shots, but hey, credit where credit's due. After tagging the dorsal fin of the Meg, the team pulls Jonas in. A little too fast, resulting in the shark chasing after its tasty new lure. Thus they pull even harder while driving the boat away in hopes of outpacing the Meg. which very courteously jukes to the side to avoid slamming into their boat. I mean, it just took down three shark poaching vessels, but takes down theirs movably over too quickly. Now with the tracker in place, they move on to stage two of the operation. Kill the Meg! Simple enough, get some super potent poison into a harpoon, along with a super high-tech polycarbonate shark cage, and drop them into the ocean along with the one who will go up against the Meg. Suyin, not Jonas. Oh, that's a surefire way to make sure things won't go as planned. Let me go it's hey, Don't worry about me. Let me do what I do best. Sell movie tickets to the Chinese market? So she goes down and we get our tense shark cage scene. Interestingly enough, the thing actually works. I mean, the woman is being thrashed around and is not going easy, but the shark cage is managing to withstand the abuse pretty well. This means she is able to eventually get off the shot and inject the poison into the Meg no problem. Or, well, plenty of problems, but they don't stop her. However, the bite force of the Meg not being able to crush the shark cage isn't much of a help when the fucking thing's big enough to just swallow the thing whole. A few flying pieces of equipment and crew members later, and she is freed from its grip, but losing oxygen fast. Thus, Jonas swims down there to save her! She's already unconscious, but he does manage to free her from the cage. And then... The laws of physics say fuck you long enough to allow the plot to continue. I mean, yeah, that's a tense scene, the shark right there biting at him and they're just inches away, but we all know in the ocean, in water, there's no fucking way that floaty ass boat is going to just completely stop the Meg. Those motherfuckers would be dead. In this version of events, though, it's the Meg who is dead, finally succumbing to the poison they injected into it. 
Suyin, on the other hand, has lived, saved by Jonah, which means she's right by his side when, upon observing the shark, the crew twisted the laws of physics further to actually get on the boat, realizes the bite marks on the tunnels were actually quite a bit larger than the jaws on this thing. Wonder why that is? Because they caught the wrong shark. <laughs> like in Jaws. Except I feel like it's more of a homage than a straight ripoff. I mean, in this, it is a megalodon who did kill people, and they caught it. It just wasn't the right one. Whereas in Jaws, it was a great white shark that was going around killing people, so the authorities go out and just kill a random shark and say, problem solved. A ripoff of that would be more like Snow Beast, where a yeti is terrorizing a ski resort and killing people. So the authorities go out and kill a bear. Problem solved. So, in fact, there were two Megalodons! Or three. At least three. And they smashed the boat the heroes came in on. This results in Dr. Zhang being horribly wounded, and several of the scientists finding themselves in precarious situations. However, Heller realizes that the Meg is coming back, and in order to save Jax's life, he sacrifices himself, luring the Meg his way to buy them some time! I'm still waiting to see when I can make a takeout Chinese joke. While the crew collectively tries to make sense of the plot so far, in order to figure out just what the hell they're supposed to do next, Mac realizes, hey, there's a few spare little boats nearby they can use to escape. That, combined with Morse's sat phone, means they can not only get back to Mana 1, but Morse can call in a helicopter to tag the Meg and get it off their backs for the time being. Oh, and along the way, Dr. Zhang dies. Sad. Ah, well, life goes on, and Morse lets everyone know what favors he's been pulling to deal with this problem. I've informed the Chinese government about the Meg, as well as the authorities in Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Australia. Australia seemed less shocked about it. Spent a little time laughing at me for thinking that a big shark was even a problem. So he ensures everyone that it's going to be taken care of, and he's really sorry. Rescue boat's coming tomorrow to pick him up. Toodles! However, when he gets in the helicopter, we learn the truth. He knows that if word gets out that his operation let a fucking megalodon loose in the ocean, it's going to be really, really hard to shake off that bad publicity. However, he and his team of mercs could just blow the damn thing out of the water before anyone finds out, and his brand will be relatively unharmed. Thus, they head out, following the megalodon's signal, and lay waste to the massive creature they find using some handy-dandy makeshift depth charges. Now just to check the thing's teeth and make sure they killed the right shark this time. That thing doesn't have any teeth. What? I think we killed a whale. Well, so much for avoiding negative publicity. Thus he tells them to get the fuck out of here, which they do. So quickly, in fact, they leave him behind. Also, a little factoid about whale carcasses at sea. They tend to attract sharks. Many sharks going into what is colloquially known as a feeding frenzy. No surprise, the Meg shows up as well and takes a bite! Just barely missing our friend Morris here. Oof. And you gotta admit, despite being PG-13, the filmmakers still really push the envelope for gore and visceral shots. Also, it doesn't take too long for everyone back at base to realize that, no, Morris didn't call anyone about the Megalodon. Also, calling them now really doesn't do anything anyway. No one fucking believes in that a prehistoric sea monster just so happens to be roaming around the Pacific looking for victims. Therefore, only they stand between it and its breakfast. With that, they head out. Because we're about to evac, right? Like, evacuate? Like, lead an area of imminent danger and go to a safe place like normal people? Uh, yeah, the movie doesn't really take itself too seriously, but I really don't think that's a bad thing. I find it more like in Robocop, where the humor is there to allow you to still be able to sit back and enjoy the horribly terrible situation that everyone has found themselves in. It doesn't take our team long to figure out where the shark is heading. Sanya Bay, home of ridiculously populated beaches. Their plan is to lure it away with some handy-dandy whale songs, but first, along the way, the Megalodon makes a stop at a yacht wedding ceremony for a bite of the reception. Pippin! Pippin, Pippin! 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 Ha! Pippin! Just like Pippet, the dog from Jaws! <laughs> Whatever happened to old Pippet? Oh yeah! That! Well... Oh. So much for feeling good during the climax.
This transitions over to the beach in question where another scene pays homage to Jaws. And by homage, I mean... It's pretty much the exact same scene. Remember that kid in Jaws? He got... Yeah, moving on. So while the heroes do their heroics far, far away from the people who need their help, we see those people. Oh, so many of those people. And those people in question see something that will change their lives forever. Oh my god. Uh... I don't think that I have ever seen any character in cinema that I personally identify with stronger than this. Unfortunately for these beach bums, the Meg closes in soon enough, causing chaos as it drags the floating platforms along the ocean floor. It attacks the swimmers, gobbling them up like extra-large helpings of Chinese takeout. Hey, I finally got to say that one. Now, with the unimportant extras packed into its unlimited belly, the Meg makes a line for the little kid! Saved in the nick of time! Good for him. It's just too bad for the dozens of other motherfuckers who we weren't supposed to care about. The Meg makes his way back over to our group of heroes, with Jonas and Su Yin and their little explorer subs now equipped with weapons to take that sumbitch on. Su Yin's shot doesn't quite make it, but not to worry. Jonas has the perfect shot lined up, and enough time to get that epic action hero line out before killing the big bad monster. Sure, this, you ugly bastard. <laughs> it's not all lost, maybe be like, hey, Meg, Meg, I think we got off on the wrong fin here. But just because by all accounts Jonas is fucking dead, that doesn't mean shit in a movie where the laws of physics are merely optional. Thus he utilizes the skills he perfected after years of playing Echo the Dolphin on Sega Dreamcast, before going forth and tearing the Meg's belly open from its neck down to its tail, resulting not only in a wound that should just kill the thing outright, but spraying enough blood into the water to summon another feeding frenzy. Therefore, happy ending! The Megalodon is dead, while the vast majority of good guys are alive! Suyin is alive, Jonas is alive, and Pippin is alive! All is right and good in this world. Except for that shark that swam out of the Meg's mouth that may or may not be Angel the Megalodon, which every single sequel in the book series follows. Little details. Point is, save world, get girl. Anyway, that was the Meg. And it's not some profound piece of art that's going to change the way you see the world, and you absolutely must go see this movie! That's never what it was trying to be in the first place. The Meg is a movie about a giant fucking prehistoric shark that terrorizes around the ocean off the coast of China, like Jaws, but with Jason Statham. If that sounds like a good time to you, you're probably gonna like this movie. If not, then I'm pretty sure you weren't the target audience. For what it's worth, The Meg does what it does really fucking well. The presentation is top-notch, and while yes, there is an absolute ass-ton of CGI in this movie, most of it looks very good, and The Meg in question is beautifully animated. There are a few spots here and there I feel could have been done better, but they still aren't really bad. The main attraction in this monster movie, unsurprisingly, are the human characters. And I think this is one of the areas where the Meg really shines. Most of the characters are given a plenty of time to establish themselves, and it's very rare that any of them feel like high-paid extras just standing in the background. This meant for the first time in a long time I was watching a monster movie where I was rooting for the humans because I actually liked them and wanted them to live. Overall, The Make is a pretty fun movie. Maybe it's a bit long, coming in at just under two hours when it could have squeezed that into 90 minutes without too much effort, but the impressive establishing shots and tech on display meant I really didn't mind how long it was. It's popcorn entertainment, but high-quality popcorn entertainment. As in Orville Redenbacher's, not some gourmet $50 for 10 kernels high-class popcorn. Coming in at a solid three super high-tech smart subscreens out of five. I feel like this, you know, could have been a four, but it's still a very straightforward story, and I still have no idea where in the fuck the Megalodon from the opening came from. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, don't poach sharks. Or, well, you know, poaching in general is a bad idea. That's why it's illegal!
I can't swim. Now get out of here. Really? Don't put a racist stuff on me.